Hello, welcome to this week's Cleve Tech Tech Tip. And today we're talking preparation for the Slot Car World Championships. If you're a member of various social media platforms, you might very well have seen people posting all about their preparation for the upcoming World Championships in Latvia. Well, I'm no different. I'm on my way there and I have started preparing my stuff for that event too. This is the biggest event on the slot racing calendar for the year. Um, there's 139 people, as I looked today on the website, registered to go and race in the team race, which is the first event. And what you can see in front of me is a practice car that I'm preparing for some of the practice. But the event starts on the 5th of September and carries on till the 17th of September, if you make it all the way to the end in the last class. We'll talk about the other classes in some upcoming videos, but we're going to concentrate on the very first class, which is 24th Production Team Race. And what do you need to prepare? Well, in an effort to try and make people think that it's all an even playing field, you don't get to use your own car, really. You get a handout chassis, you get a handout motor, you get handout tyres, a handout body shell, and you have to build the whole thing up before the race. So you get some time in the morning, you get your car, you get all your parts. So this car here is going to be one of my practice cars, um, just for some of the day's practice beforehand. But it's handy to look at it because you need to get prepared all the stuff that's going to go onto this car when you get all your handout parts. So we need to think about, have we got a guide prepared? Have we got things like pin tubes prepared? Do we have yeah, all the braids set up, everything already? Do we have rear axle bushes? already prepared, ready to go in the car when we're assembling it. So there's a few things that you need to get ready in advance to make sure you're not rushing when you're doing the build of the car. And it will definitely speed things up in the morning when you're trying to put together all your handout parts. So what's this little device for? Well, I was preparing my gears and thinking about what am I going to use in terms of gearing on the car. And then it's, it reminded me that really I ought to show you this little thing about how you can improve the preparation of your gears. So I visited the track before and I'll show you a little clip in a moment of some practice or some qualifying that went on on the track so you can see the kind of thing we're racing. So that was a one minute qualifying session you've seen. For the gearing, I'm going to consider using these two gears here. So I've got an Atan gear and a Cahosa gear. Now one's a 41, one's a 43, and I'm probably going to be using a seven tooth pinion on the handout motor. But I thought, well, I need to get perhaps both prepared, and then how am I going to prepare them to get the best result? Well, you might have seen my video on gluing gears on, so I'll put a link up here. But for this class, you're not allowed to glue the gear on. It has to be on a 332 axle, solid axle, and it has to be the set screw in the gear and held on in that manner. You're not allowed to glue the gears on. So that poses some problems, and I will show you. So here's an axle. I'm just going to put it onto my axle checker. So I put it in there, hold it against the V-blocks, and I turn it, spin it round. And you can see that as I'm spinning this axle, there's not a lot of deflection in the end of that axle, less than one hundredth of a millimetre. Like that, you can see the needle moving. It's less than a hundredth of a millimetre on the end of that axle. But then I'm going to put the gear on the axle pretty much where it's going to be when it sits in the car. So it's going to sit, turn the car around more or less like that. 
So that's where the gear is going to sit and I'll tighten up the grab screw on the gear like that. Put it back on and now watch what happens. Can you see how much deflection there is now? I make it to nearly three hundredths of a millimetre of deflection. Now what, because that axle is wobbling like this in effect at the end, any wheel or tyre that's going to go on the end is also going to wobble. That's going to create vibration on your car. So the axle is not running very true. And that's all because this grub screw in here, when it's tightened against the axle, it causes a small bend in the axle and then causes the axle obviously to not run true on the end. If I just put the gear on and I just loosen the grub screw a fraction, like that, so the gear is the gear is now not quite so tight on the axle, and I spin it, you can see we've got a lot less deflection on that axle already. But that's not going to be any good because it needs to be tight to grip the axle to work. So anyway, let's take that off of let's take that gear off of that axle. Like that. And I've got another axle here. And I'm just going to put it back on the checker just to make sure. Spin that round. Virtually no movement at all on this axle. You can see I'm spinning it. Doesn't deflect at all. Doesn't really notice any movement. So I'm going to put this gear onto this axle. And I'm going to tighten it up. Again, in the right place. Now let's put it on our checker. So with this axle, and I've done that up tight, I'm getting maybe a hundredth of a millimetre's deflection there. So nowhere near as much. Third of deflection I got with the other axle. So again, selecting perhaps the right axle that matches your gear nicely is going to help you make your car run faster and truer. Let's just see what happens if I take that gear off of there and I put my Cohosa gear on instead. Like that, tighten that up, put that on the axle and spin. Again, maybe a hundredth of a millimetre's deflection there. Or run out on that gear. So they both fit that axle quite nicely. So perhaps selecting your brand of axle to match the gears you intend using Maybe having an axle that is perhaps a little bit harder so it's not quite so flexible, so it doesn't bend when you're tightening up your grub screw. So think carefully and try and match your axles with your gears to make sure that you've got a nice true axle that's got less run out when you'd have to tighten your gear onto your axle. Meanwhile, the Israel World Championships truly is a world championship. There's drivers coming from all over the world to compete. And the beauty about ISRA is it's the same rules in different countries. So we can race cars, say like this, for example, here, this production car to Israel rules, and they race these all over the world in all the different countries, all to the same rules. And you can take your car, you can go and race it somewhere else, and it's brilliant. You don't have to worry about, oh, what do they race over there? What have I got to change in my car all the time? So having a unified set of rules, such as ISRA, and here in the UK, BSCRA, a unified set of rules which also match in nearly exactly with ISRA rules, we can race the same types of car all over the country, all over the world and compete against people um, from lots of different clubs racing all the same things and it's a great situation to have in the slot racing world. So let's have a look at some of the things I've got ready. So I've got ready my guide with my lead wires already attached to it. I've got my braids already in there. Now getting the front of these JK chassis really low is really important. They tend to handle really well when they're very low down on the track. But again, depending on where you qualify, there could be a lot of rubber build up on the track. With 139 drivers going round and laying all of that handout rubber on the track for uh, quite a long time of practice, there gets to be quite a large rubber build up on the track and it tends to dry out quite a lot. So you might sometimes want to lift the front of the car up a little bit so that these two front ears on the chassis are not running through the rubber. So you need the ability to either run the chassis really hard down on the deck or lift it up a little bit um, for setup purposes. 
So you've got to make sure that your guide is going to fit under one of these chassis nicely. Now, I'm going to show you on this one, because this one's one of the newer pressings. You can see the way the guide tab is pressed. It's not quite as deep as some of the earlier pressings, which are much sort of sharper around here. So these are probably the version that we're going to get handed out. So you need to make sure that you're running a cut down guide or a low profile guide to make sure that it sits you know, as high up in the chassis as you can so you can get the front down nice and low. I've got some nice thin braids in here, SCB super thin. And if you haven't noticed, this is a Samson weighted guide as well. Um, great guides. I like these HP guides and the weighting is just superb with tungsten weights inside it. What else have I got here? Well, I've got my rear axle bushes. So I'm just going to show you up close what I've done with these. So here's my rear axle bushing. So you can see it's got a slot all the way around the outside of it or a groove or a channel that allows it to fit into the pillar blocks of the chassis nicely and give you sort of location and you can align it properly. Also, I don't know whether you can see inside, but there's a little groove around the inside of the bushing as well. And that groove should retain a little bit of oil and stop the bushing from seizing up on the axle. If you haven't watched my video on how to build one of these JK C43 chassis, have a look. I've got a whole playlist, a whole series. I'll put a link up there. Now, one thing I didn't particularly mention in that video was in terms of the back end and setting up the width of the back end. When you put your bushes into the chassis at the rear end, you want to make sure that ideally the rear end is, I think, about 35.2 millimetres. I think that works out right. 35.2 millimetres wide. Because if the back end is 35.2 millimetres wide, when you put your gear and your tyres on, you shouldn't really need any spaces at all at the back end. And that makes changing gears and so on, setting your car up so much easier than putting little spaces in. It obviously depends slightly on the type of gear you use. But if it is 35.2, your gear is roughly 6.6 millimetres, and then your two tyres are 20.6 millimetres on each side. That makes up 83 millimetres in total, which is your maximum width for the car. So potentially going slightly under 35.2 means you've got a little bit of play to make sure you're not going to be over width in technical inspection. Next up, I've got my pin tubes. And these are rattly or floaty pin tubes. I think these are mid-America pin tubes. But again, because you're not allowed to do anything with a chassis, apart from just sort of flatten it out and try and get it to sit as best you can, you can't open out any holes or grind or uh, remove any material, etc. But you can remove a little bit from this floating pin tube here to make sure that these pin tubes rattle nicely in the holes of the chassis. So how did I remove that little extra bit of material? Well, very easily, really. I put it into my little Dremels here. I've got some Proxon uh, Dremels as well, or Proxon rotary tools, like this one here. But these can be quite cumbersome with a big lead. We've got, obviously, they've got a big lead on them, like this. And if you're going to use two together, which I'm going to show you in a minute, it's nice to have a battery one. And also, having a battery one to travel with and fly abroad with is really good because they're nice and small and lightweight too. So basically what I do, I can put that in the chuck at one end on my battery Dremel. Whoops, I haven't tightened it up. 12 seconds later. So I found my bit of pin tube on the bench again. So I've got my Proxon in one hand. I've got my Tac Life battery Dremel in the other. And then I can literally turn them both on. And I just grind a little bit like that with alternative directions. And I can grind out a smaller diameter just on the part where it goes through the chassis, just to make sure it's got plenty of movement and plenty of wobble in those holes on the C43 chassis. And by the way, if you look under the video, in the video description, I've put some links of where you can get these from via Amazon at some great prices. Uh, this one especially is a great price. Uh, the Proxons are fantastic pieces of equipment. They're a little bit more expensive, but again, they last for forever, really. I've never replaced one. I've had this for years and years and years, and it's still going nice and strong. Now you also don't want to forget your body pins as well. These are Coford short pins, but I've shortened them some more. I've also turned a point 
on the end of the pin, just in case, because if you get into an accident, you need to repair the body shell. You don't want to have to get a sharp pin to sort of puncture any repair you've made with a bit of tape, etc. You don't want to get a separate pin to puncture the hole, then get your body pin back again and put that in. Whereas if your body pin's got a nice sharp end, you can just push that straight through the repair and back into the pin tube like so. So again, make sure that they fit your pin tubes nicely because some pin tubes have different internal diameters and some pins need bending different amounts to fit the different pin tubes. So again, making sure your pins match your pin tube will save you a bit of time when building the car at the actual event. And last but not least, I need to take my body jig with me so that I can set this body jig up with my chassis. I can then set these pin guides here up to the right height. I can take off the wing mount so I can set my rear wing height at the back using my body jig like this. So all of this can all be done in advance like so. So that would be set to the maximum height for the body that I'm allowed. I could then have my uh, a spare chassis or my practice chassis. I could set it all up with my practice chassis using my body jig, align where my holes are going to go on my body shell so that when I get the handout body shell, I can quickly trim the front of the body shell, can quickly trim a little bit away at the back of the body shell, put the body shell on and pin it in the right place. And you get two shells. You can only use one for the race, but you get two shells. So I can pin both shells all at once, nice and quickly. They come pre-painted, so I haven't got to paint them, but I do have to cut them out and reinforce them if necessary as well. So if you haven't seen my body jig in action, I'll put a link to the video up there in the top corner. Back on the subject of building the chassis again, there is one little thing that I haven't tried yet. I haven't opened the packet yet, but it looks quite interesting. Again, comes from Samson Classics, and it's a little jig for pre-soldering the motor brace to the motor. So if you can see here, these motor braces that come with the chassis here, you'll get one of those at the, with the handout chassis. And here's a little jig to help you pre-solder that to your motor. So again, you don't overheat the motor perhaps, get it too hot, you can make a nice, neat, flat solder joint on it without angling the motor bracket or the motor brace too much. So I'm gonna try this out when I'm building one of those chassis and I'll let you know how it goes. So now that I've got my bits and pieces ready for building the team race car, I'm gonna to have to crack on with preparing for some of the other classes. For the Formula One class, the 32nd Eurosport class and the 24th Eurosport class. They're all individual classes. You can run your own cars, your own motors, etc., etc. So we'll talk about that next time. But something I do wanna say is thank you very, very much to the people that have used the thanks button down below. I've had some people uh, use the thanks button, make a small contribution towards my channel and everything really helps. Uh, I'm very, very grateful for people that do that. It helps me keep going with this content. It helps keep me going, giving something back to slot racing and helping people out like people have helped me out through the years as well. So thank you very much. And if you do feel very kind and want to contribute a little and help me keep going, say there's a thanks button down here. Click on that and make a small donation. It's very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Also hit the thumbs up if you like my videos and subscribe by hitting the C, have a look at my other videos, and I'll see you again next time for some more preparation for the Slot Car World Championships.